It's good to see each one of you here and uh, on this New Year's Eve day. Well, um, I trust that all of you have had a very merry Christmas season with uh, friends and family. I know that we certainly have. It's been a really relaxing time. I, my son Jordan's still here with us, and Daniel, he's here with us too, and we've just really had a relaxing, good time as a family, and uh, yeah, it was just wonderful to see everyone on, uh, on Christmas Day, or on Christmas Eve Day, and on Christmas Eve uh, candlelight service. It was just phenomenal. I've, I've just been doing a lot of reflecting and a lot of thinking about, um, about everything, and um, yeah, this week has been a a time of deep reflection for me, and um, you know, in the midst of our family gathering, I, I've had time to just, you know, get get alone and to think about what God would have me to say to you this morning, because I believe He's got a word for you, and um, I'm just going to pray. If you'd pray with me um, for the Lord's blessing upon this message, Jesus, we come to you today, um, and we ask God that you would. You administer um, to each heart, Lord, that our hearts would be open to hear um, what your word says, God, that you'd guide me in presenting what it is that you've laid on my heart so that, Father, it would be something that causes, um, causes folks to think and also to maybe come to places in their lives where they surrender, God, we just want to thank you for the year that has been. Lord, 2023 has been a year where we've seen reprieve from the previous difficult years, and there's been a lot of good things that have been happening around here and in different people's hearts as you've brought new growth. And Father, we just, we just pray this morning that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we long to honor you with our lives, and we just pray your blessing upon the message today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I think, given what I just said there, um, you know, it's a normal process for us to take stock and analyze where we started at the beginning of any year that uh, we're looking back on. And... and um, Sometimes that reflection is health, very healthy, actually. It, it helps us to evaluate where we find ourselves standing in the present. And the hope is that reflecting upon what has been, that we will continue to do that which has been beneficial and good. And also that we would identify different areas where we've had struggles and areas that we can continue to improve in our lives. And for some, this, this year has been a year of radical change. And I know of people, maybe someone here today, who has um, just started their journey of faith in Jesus as a new believer. You've come to understand the love of God for you, and you've accepted that, and the Spirit of God has given you new life inside. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. I hope to have a baptismal service here in the next month or two. Um, so please, if you've made that decision, come talk to me. It's important to follow the Lord and in, in, into the baptismal. And uh, it's a, an outward sign of an inward change, and it's, the Lord desires that for you. But um, there's been people that have had um, changes. Maybe some of you have just moved to the 100-mile house area, there's new families and faces that I see out in the, in the congregation. You've come from different places, and God's brought you here. And um, maybe that's been a good thing, been a good change for you. But sometimes when you move to a new place, there can be differences of culture and difference that you, you leave a set of friends behind. And, and those kind of changes can be stressful, and they can be difficult. It can be a lonely time. I remember the first couple of years that we were here in the 100-mile area. My wife didn't feel much at home for the first two years here because all of the friends that she had built in the former place that we used to live were on her heart, and it was difficult for her. So there's been transitions. There's been changes. Um, sometimes uh, when we look back on a year, we see a year of loss. 
Maybe we've lost a loved one. Maybe we've had to go through a difficult time where, where maybe our physical health has been an issue and something has happened that we weren't anticipating. Um, there's been loss for some people, and, and some have just come from brokenness, and they've rededicated their lives to Christ, and they're not sure where to go from here, but God has been starting something new in them. There's been some new things that God has been doing inside of your heart, rebuilding you spiritually from maybe uh, a past place of strength where you've, um, for whatever reason, drifted, and God's bringing you back. Well, that, that's, maybe that's 2023 for some of you. Well, as your pastor, I'm thankful to God's faithfulness. I'm thankful for his faithfulness collectively. Individually, I've grown a lot this past year. And uh, collectively, I think our church has grown a lot as well. On a practical level, at HCC here, Hillside Community Church, we've seen many positive changes. And, um, you know, as you guys can see downstairs, we've had this huge renovation project that um, God's blessing has been upon, and there's some miracles that we saw associated to that, how God just put everything together and helped us with that so that we could have a, a, a larger hall to, to gather together and to, and, and to put on events and, and a, a good place for our children's ministries to be able to expand and to, and to conduct their uh, activities. Uh, that, that's been a real blessing. Um, you know, we've seen, um, we've seen changes. We've seen our, our youth pastor, Pastor Jonathan, has come to start working with us this past September, and that's we're, we're just blessed by having you here, Jonathan. We're, we're so happy that God brought you here to be with, with us and part of this family. And, and, and you know, there's just different things. Um, there's been a growth of numbers in our assembly um, that we haven't seen for a long time. And um, a lot of you are part of that. There's growth in discipleship, new Fellowship groups have started over the past year. There's been people that have been willing to open their homes and to host home fellowship groups um, for the discipleship of the saints in, 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 in the church here. Awesome. Very good. So on a practical level, there's been, there's been a lot of good things that have happened over this past year. And um, on a logistical level, many of you that are new to our assembly here, did you know that you're an answer to our prayers? Ever since I started pastoring here, all the time, we've been praying this prayer. God, you know the people that are supposed to be part of this work here. Because you've got a plan for 100 miles. You've got a plan for this area. You've got a plan to use your church here. Lord, would you please bring the people that are supposed to be part of this group of believers here. There's other groups of believers, but we've been praying specifically for you, that you would come. Why? Because God knows the DNA of our assembly, and he knows each person that makes up that, that, is, that DNA. And you're part of that. You're an important part of that. You're an answer to God, to, God, uh, to the prayer that we've lifted up to the Lord. So logistically, you know, God has called you here to partner with the other believers that you're sitting with. Um, in preparation for something that he wants to do in this area and maybe beyond this area. Um, well, not maybe, for sure. But how far that goes, I don't know. But the Lord knows. He has plans. And my prayer is that God would help us to grow into an assembly that is in partnership with other assemblies and other ministries and that we're effective in taking the message of the gospel into our community and to the ends of the earth. You know, we have very little time. We have very little time. We're in the last days. I mean, we see it. I mean, you look at the, the news that's out there and just the, just the things that are happening in this world. Well, so logistically, there's been good things going on. On a spiritual level, I look at what God's been doing in, in so many of your lives, and, and I'm so thankful. But my prayer for 2024 is that God would continue to enlarge our capacity so that we can effectively meet the local spiritual needs in the caribou, and that we'd also be able to give generously to missions around the world to support God's work globally in other places. That's what we need. We need to have an outward look here 
And my prayer is spiritually that we wouldn't look inward, that we would look outward. We'd see what God is doing here, but we'd see it from a greater perspective that the reason he does good things here is so that we can give away what he gives to us. Amen? So, huh, the time is limited. Jesus is coming soon. One day the curtain will drop. And if we're a healthy church, we must pursue and maintain God's perspectives over the next year. It's not a matter of if. If we're to be a healthy church, we must be in connection with the Lord. We must follow him. Now, God's perspective on things sometimes is different than our own perspective, right? So we want to we be a church in the future spiritually that connects with God's perspective and does what God wants to do. So it's not a matter of, of building something here for ourselves. This is for the glory of God. And we need to be tapped in to what God wants to do here. And if we are, we're going to be healthy. And that's the bottom line. God wants us to grow healthy, to be healthy. And thankfully, the Lord has given us every provision that we need to enter this new year on the right track and to be a healthy church. So the question is, Pastor, and the question that I've been reflecting upon this past week here really intently, is what does a healthy church look like? Like if we're, if we're called to be healthy, what does a healthy church look like? There's been a lot of writing about healthy churches and what they look like. And there's different opinions about what health looks like out there. But I want to share with you what I believe God would have us understand about being healthy as we enter a new year. And before we get into God's word, when we think about church, what do we think about? Do we think about this building? I go to church on Sunday. What does that mean? Is it an institution that we're part of? Is it a building? As we think about health in the church, we have to come to an understanding properly of what the church is. And breaking it down to a cellular level, did you know, and I've said this before, and maybe you've heard it before from other pastors or preachers, the church is not the building that we sit in. It's not a denomination that we're a part of. At a cellular level, individually, the church is you. You are the church. And every disciple that is part of the collective church is precious to God and has, and has a place in God's overarching plan. Did you know that? Even little children that are here today, you know if you are a child of God, you've come to ask Jesus to be your Savior, you are part of the church. You are the church too. We don't overlook you because you're young. No, you are the future. And we love you. And we want you to know the power of God for, for your future. It's, it's so important, kids, that you understand that God isn't just out there somewhere. He is here. He's as close as the mention of his name. And when you become a believer in Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God comes into your heart, into your spirit, and he makes his home inside of you. You are a part of the church. Each of you are. So when I speak to you about being a healthy church, I'm talking to old people that are in their 90s and maybe over 100. I'm talking to young kids who have just barely come to understand what it means to be a believer in Jesus. You're just brand new. All of you are part of it. To the extent that you, sitting in the pew right there, where you are, right? To the extent that you are healthy and honoring Jesus with your life, that is the extent to which the church in, in greater will be healthy, powerful, and honoring to Christ. 
In the Old Testament, when the first temple in Jerusalem was constructed, King Solomon had a psalm, and it's actually recorded in the book of Psalms, which is mostly written by David, but King Solomon had a psalm in in Psalm 127, verses 1 and 2. And you know, I've I've taken this week just to reflect and relax and spend time with my family. So I haven't had a lot of connection with my leadership team over the past week. Basically, it's been who's doing what, and then we're just going back to our families and doing our family stuff. Do you know that last song? Can I, can I get the first stanza of the last song put up on the screen here quickly? I, I just want to share something with you. Because this is of God. I don't know if we can backtrack to it. Ah, should nothing of our efforts uh, stand... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive. Unless the Lord doth raise the house, in vain its builders strive. Pay attention to that. Because I did not connect with Morgan Casper this morning as to what the theme of this service was all going to, I mean, it's New Year's for sure. But I didn't connect with him about the scripture that's on that slide right there. Because in my sermon prep right now, I'm going to read to you Psalm 127, 1 and 2. And this is just a testament that we are not the ones who control what goes on around here. We are the bride of Christ. And the Spirit of the living God is the one who speaks here. Yes, we can take it off track, but I'm telling you that God desires to lead us by His Spirit into all things that are proper and good. Psalm 127, 1 and 2. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. In, it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep. He gives his beloved sleep. You see, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds a church, the builders of the church labor in vain. There are churches out there that have gone off track. They're building their own thing for their own purposes to achieve their own goals. And they're not in sync with the Lord. I don't want to be that place. I know you don't either. We want to be a place that the Lord builds. Lord, would you please build this house, this assembly of believers that trust you? Would you be at the would you be at the the wheel? Would you be the one who guides us and leads us? Why do we do what we do as Christians? Why do we do what we do? An important question for us to ask in everything that we undertake, particularly when we're planning for a new year. Is what I do in life, at home, at work, at school, and in the assembly of believers done for the glory of God or for other reasons? Is my attitude partitioned? I'm just asking the question. We need to ask this. Do I only God give God a small portion of who I am? Do my energies and resources belong to me? Or do I recognize that my job, my health, my family, my finances, my resources are all things that have been given by me, to me, by God to steward? The world considers all of their time, all of their energy, all of their finances, all of their resources as belonging to themselves, to be managed by themselves for their own benefit. That's the way of the world. But is this the attitude God wants his children to be embracing? I ask you this question. Because the answer to it makes all the difference in what kind of church we're going to be. As a church, we can raise our families. We can engage in recreational or community activities. We can work. We can invest. We can build equity in our homes. We can even establish home fellowship groups as part of our church activities, run a variety of children and youth and adult programs in our assemblies or pour all kinds of energy into charitable activities. 
But if we lose sight that everything in all of creation was made by Jesus and for him, if we're going to do all of the striving to get these things and to achieve these things merely to build our lives for ourselves in a better way, all of our striving, all of our laboring, all of our building, all of our developing, all of our successful ventures and amassing will be labor in vain. Oh, people. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says this. <coughs> Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. <coughs> Can I get some water from someone, please? Thank you. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. He is good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay. This scripture verse. Many have taken that scripture verse that I just read. This scripture verse right here. And <clears throat> they've used it as a reference point to encourage believers to abstain from fleshly sins. Well, that's true, right? That scripture does apply to that, to the abstinence from fleshly sins. It, it definitely applies to that. While it is true that this verse applies to that area, it's not the only area that it's limited to. It also speaks to the stewardship of our life resources and what we do with our time, our resources, and our finances. The question we should be asking ourselves as we approach the new year is this. And all of us have to stand before God and ask this. It's a personal question. In light of all the freedom, all the peace, all of the spiritual provision God has given us through Jesus, what is God's desire for us in response? What is his desire? You know what it is? God's desire is that you are spiritually healthy. He desires it. You see, if Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, then a good, healthy branch on the vine is a branch that bears much good fruit. Would you not agree? Grape vines were made for what? to bear fruit, to bear grapes. There are other plants that were made just to look pretty. Grape vines, and the reason why God calls us, like, likens us to a vine, is we're meant for a purpose, and the purpose is not just to look nice and green and leafy. The purpose is to bear much good fruit. Jesus said in John 15:8. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourself to be my disciples because the branch cannot bear fruit on its own. The branch bears fruit only as it is connected to the vine and the life of the vine comes into the branch and the life of the vine coming into the branch results in the production of fruit because that branch was made to produce good fruit. In bearing much fruit, we, in essence, are submitting ourselves to be used by the Holy Spirit of God as he sees fit to use us. And in doing so, the Lord plants us and he nurtures us and grows us into the people that he wants us to be. And he gives us provision to bear much good fruit. First Peter 2, 2 and 3, the Apostle Peter says, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. See, God doesn't want you to get saved just to taste that he is good. He wants you to grow up in your salvation and bear fruit. That's his purpose. It's that you can replicate a good thing that he does in you for God's glory. The father is the gardener. The gardener has a vineyard because he desires a harvest. And what does he desire as a harvest in us? The fruit of righteousness, my friends. 
So if I look at my job, okay, like I, I'm bivocational, I look at my job. If I look at pastoring, you know, as a job, and I look at it as my own, this is my job, this is what I do, this is my vocation. Or I go down to the police office and I organize exhibits for the RCMP. This is my job, this is mine, it's, it's, it's mine to do with what I want. My family, my family, is it my own? Does it belong to me? My resources, do they belong to me? The blessing that God gives us in resources, does that belong to me? If I think of everything that is with me on the terms that it is mine, I am going to go amiss in being fruitful the way that God wants me to be. Because none of us, as believers, we're called to be part of the kingdom of God for ourselves. We're called to the kingdom of God to bring glory to God, to bring a harvest to the Lord. Because you were not created for yourself, you were created for God. He's the gardener. He's the one that made the vine and the branches. And he's the one that wants fruit. Hmm. Okay. Romans 14. 7 and 8. Paul says this. For none of us lives for ourselves alone. And none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. You are not your own people. In an independent nation that prides itself on self-making, you are not your own. Once you become a believer in Christ, you come under the ownership of Christ. And it's not a bad thing. Jesus said, what did he say? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And to that end, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, he says, his, to his disciples, he gives them a principle and he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And here's the caveat. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I don't normally post a lot of quotes from other preachers. But I'm going to this morning. There's a, a guy by the name of Dr. David Jeremiah. And he has a quote. And I, I looked at that and I'm like, oh yeah. This is what's happening in a lot of places. And I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want this to be where we go in 2024. David Jeremiah says this. He says, many churches today have forgotten their purpose, becoming entertainment-driven social organizations eager to blend in with secular culture instead of focusing on biblical discipleship. There is an incredible motivation on the part of everyone to be successful, and a lot of times people program their churches to see how many people will sit in the pews on Sunday. He said, there's nothing wrong with getting people there as long as you share the gospel, but there's no glory in just a number. Amen? Amen. Amen. I thought, yes, that's bang on. Now, again, I often, sometimes I'll wander in to see what other churches are saying about things. And uh, the Presbyterian church, way back when, had um, this thing that they used to formulate how they were going to structure called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And it was written in 1648, and... When I looked at that, I'm like, whew, there's some really good things in this that we need to pay attention to. And part of this, I'm not going to read the whole Westminster uh, <laughs> Shorter Catechism, but I'm going to draw your attention to a couple of the points which I think apply to every church. That is going to be God honoring. And the question that the Westminster Shorter Catechism puts out there is this. 
The first one. What is the chief end of man? So we can apply this to us. What is my chief? What is my chief end? What, what, is, what am I supposed to be doing? A man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Isn't that good? Okay. What rule hath God given to direct us as to how we may glorify and enjoy him? The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us on how we may glorify and enjoy him. What is truth, friends? The Lord says, my word is truth. And what do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what a man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Wow, I just thought I'd mention this, right? With that in mind, if I, as a person, consider, if I consider the Lord to be the owner of everything that I am and everything that I have, then how will I invest and steward the time that I have in the life that I live? How will I steward the time that I have? How will I steward the resources that I have? How will I steward the finances that I have? In 2024. I'm not, I'm not making a pitch to, to benefit somehow personally. But if you're not giving to the work of the Lord, you are missing out. You're not fulfilling the mandate that God's given you because you don't own anything that you have. It's all the Lord's. So I'm going to challenge you. What are you doing with those resources? What are you doing with them? What am I doing with them? This is a personal question. I'm just putting it out there. This is the scripture speaking. What are we doing? How are we doing it? Is it eternally beneficial? Or is it something that we think, this is mine. My kingdom come. My will be done. No, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's how we're supposed to posture towards God. Amen? Amen. I know this is, uh, like I'm really getting now down into the nitty gritties here, but the scripture and, and, and Christianity was meant to be walked out. This isn't just some theoretical silo of, of intellectual knowledge out there. This was meant to be taken and applied. Why? Because God wants to bless us <laughs> with every blessing. And not talking about health, wealth, and prosperity. That's not what I'm talking about. Like all of us have a time when our bodies are going to fail and we're going to see the Lord in the air. Yeah, if God wants to preserve our life and we ask him to preserve our life, he's going to preserve our life. He's going to give us health to do what it is that he's called us to do. But the objective of God isn't this earth. The objective is to bring a harvest into his eternal kingdom in heaven forever and ever and ever. That's his objective for you, is that you'll be gathered to him and that you'll bear much good fruit while you're being prepared for, for your eternity. Oh, let's translate this further. If individuals collectively are they that make up the church, then I could put what Dr. Jeremiah says this way. Okay? Many believers have forgotten their purpose becoming entertainment-driven, selfish individuals eager to, uh, to blend in with their secular culture instead of focusing in on biblical discipleship. There is an incredible motivation on the part of the individual Christian to be successful and happy, and a lot of times to involve themselves with programs in the churches to draw in numbers so that the church programs are full and so that everyone is enjoying themselves and having fun. <laughs> is God against having fun? No. The joy of the Lord is my strength. <laughs> I'm not talking, to, this shouldn't be a dirge, this journey. We have a lot of life to live, and we've got a lot of joyful things that God wants to do in and through us. So that's not what I'm saying. Okay? But the objective of the Christian life is not just to make things enjoyable and comfortable for myself and my family. The desire for entertainment and personal comfort for me and my family cannot be the driving influence that motivates me to do what I do. It can't be. 
The chief aim of the Christian life, as mentioned in the Westminster Catechism, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Not merely to do things to glorify myself and enjoy myself forever. Yeah, you know, you can't outgive God. If you give to God your entire being, you can't outgive Him. He's going to pour out blessings upon you that you can't even contain. And I'm not, I don't know what kind of blessings it is because it's individually crafted because God knows exactly what you need before you even ask. But when you are walking in obedience to God, the blessing of God will be upon your life. I can tell you that for a fact. You might be poor as a church mouse. You might be suffering in a dungeon somewhere in Syria and be the richest person in the world with the glory of God shining in your heart with thanksgiving to the Lord who created you and gave you breath. <laughs> this is why Paul says I've learned to be content in every circumstance. Why? Because my life is not my own. Paul's life, he understood, it's not his own. He's purchased with a price and he has, has been given a mission by God to fulfill and, and he finds joy in that and the Spirit gives you joy in that. Oh, man. And this is why the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. I pray that this message spurs you on to love and good deeds. I pray that you will love in 2024 your neighbor more deeply than you have in the past year. I pray that I would too. I pray that I, I would be spurred on to love the Lord my God with more of who I am than what I did in the past year. That I would let things fall that need to fall and drop off and pursue the things that are, that are to be pursued If any activity in the collective church is being done for any other reason than to bring glory to God by building stronger families or disciples or by reaching out directly or indirectly to the unbelieving community, if anything in our collective church is being done for any other reason outside of that, we're missing the mark. Most of us who are working and trying to raise a family, our lives get extremely busy. You know what I'm talking about our lives can get really tangled up with all kinds of things going on. Potential pursuits in life are nearly endless, right? There's not enough hours in every day to do everything that we, we might want to do. And in the midst of all of life's possible pursuits, the question is this, God, what is it that you want me to pursue for your glory? That's the question of a believer that needs to be asked. Honestly. And when the answer comes, we need to obey the voice of God with everything that we are and everything that we have. Whatever that means. Is God calling you to go to uh, Bolivia and South America or whatever to, to translate the Bible into a new language? I, I'm just saying. God will provide. God will give you the heart for it. And, and, and it will happen. If you trust, if that's what you're called to do. Right? If you're called here to be a good parent and to raise a family, you, you have a noble calling. It is an awesome calling to raise a family. If you're called to be here, to be a light in your workplace, that's an awesome calling. God has ordained that for you. Find joy in it and contentment and where God has placed you. And if he wants you to go somewhere else, he's going to stir it up, and you're going to be aware. Okay. I'm not taught. Sometimes people are, dis are not content because they're not settled with God. And if you're not settled with God, you need to settle down in him. You need to settle down in him. In the midst of all the possible pursuits, when the Lord says it is will, it's his will for his church that we not forsake, for instance... In Hebrews, is that what I just read there? Right. Can I bring up Hebrews again? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Right. Church attendance isn't just to click some box for some organizational thing. That's not it. 
church attendance is necessary for spiritual health. Why? Because God made you as a community person to belong to a community. And when you're not part of a community, there's something that's not going to be there for in you. Whether you realize it or not, you need other believers by your side and they need you. You know, just as much as you need to be ministered to, there's others around you that need to be ministered to as well. And you are God's, <laughs> you're God's expression to encourage the person that's walking the road along with you. And that's why when everybody is just looking at church as a place to go to once a Sunday or whatever, that's not what God's purpose is. God's purpose is that we find community together, that we live together, that we have small group settings and gatherings with other believers. All the more since the day is approaching, how can we love our brethren when we have nothing to do with them? Really? How can we? We can't. You can't love someone when you don't know them. We need to get to know one another so that we can pour into each other's lives. Because there's going to be times like this morning when my brother, two of my brothers gathered around me and prayed for something that's really weighing heavily on my heart. I needed that. I needed that prayer. You do too. Because life isn't a, isn't a cakewalk all the time, is it? We face trials, we face tribulations, we face temptations of various kinds. There's all this going on all the time. You need one another. You need to be a community. If we're going to be a church that is honoring to God, a healthy church, we've got to come together and relish those times when we are together and enjoy each other's company. And that means we have to check our pride in at the door because there's going to be things that are going to happen that we're going to get our feathers ruffled by. I probably ruffled someone's feathers here. You probably ruffled mine. Guess what? The Bible says love one another. Ah, I'm sorry if I've ruffled your feathers some way. I am. Please forgive me. I mean that from my heart. You need to be saying the same thing to your brothers and sisters out there too. We all need to do this. Because community can't happen unless we have relationships. And we are called by God. This is God's idea. This is not mine. Jesus is coming. What's our priorities in 2024? Hmm. Okay. I know that I, I've carried on a long time here, so I'm going to wrap it. But I want to read for you what was happening. When God established the first church in Jerusalem, something was happening in that place. Something good. And it was left in the book of Acts as a template for us to look at and to say, hey, is that what our assembly of believers looks like? And if not, Lord, can you do your work and, 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 and bring us back to your template? Because this is your template that was given. In Acts 2, 42 to 47, what does it read here? And we're doing a lot of these things. Don't get me wrong, people. We are doing a lot of these things. But when we evaluate, there's areas where we need to continue to draw closer to Christ in. Whereas a church, we need to grow further and deeper. We need to love each other more and more as we see the day approaching. Acts 2, 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and of prayer. <laughs> That's important stuff. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's a template. I'm not saying the culture is the same. We don't have a temple here. We're not going to meet in, in this assembly building here every day. <laughs> That's just, you know, there's different things in our culture, but do you see the flavor of what's being pr promoted here? What God's saying? What was, what was God saying through here? 
Guess what he's saying? He's, this is the template of a, faith, of, of, a, of a healthy church. You want to look at a portrait of a healthy church? This is a portrait of a healthy church. Why? Because, first of all, and I'm going to mention them before we pray, if you've got a notepad and you want to take notes, this is a good time. A healthy church is committed and faithful in prayer. Why? Because it's not us that draws people to Christ. It's not us that causes the work to happen inside of a person to grow spiritually. That's God's. We need God at the helm. We need to be people of prayer. 2024, if you're not a person of prayer and you're just trudging through the day and you're barely considering this, God wants to resurrect your intimacy with him and closeness with him. A healthy church is committed and faithful in prayer. I just noticed I did a typo. A healthy church, secondly, is Bible-centered. Folks, the word of God is truth. And unless we are people of the word, we're not going to know where to go. We're not going to know how to act. We're not going to know what to believe the word of God is, 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 is what? Useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness? Why? So that the people of God, the man of, man of God, might be fully equipped for every good work. To be prepared to face the world out there and to be the light of Christ, you need to be a student of the word. Get into the word and the word will get into you. The Holy Spirit will make sure that happens. You start to pray, God, show me your way. As you read the word, the Spirit will speak. And it'll revolutionize how you look at things. A healthy church is, has a strong leadership team. You see, with the early church there, the apostles, were, they spent time with Christ, and then Christ sent them out and had them establish the first church. They are healthy. Why? Because they spent time with Jesus. Leaders, if we're going to be healthy church, we need to spend time with Jesus. We need to be exemplary in the areas of prayer. It just can't be window dressing. It has to be our heart beat, our heartbeat. Because as we go, there will the other people go. Leadership always leads. And if the leadership is not in prayer, you have a big problem. We don't want to be that church, okay, where we're not praying. And also, not just praying, but also caring for the, the flock. Leaders, Whatever you're leading, what do you do? What do you do the things that you do for? Is it for the glory of God? We need to start acting like it sometimes because sometimes we do it as if it's just another task that we have. Uh uh, it's not a task. It is your calling. <laughs> Take it seriously. You you are called to lead. So lead with all of what God has given you and lead with all of your heart as someone who is accountable to the Lord. I'm, say, I'm preaching this to myself, guys. A healthy church has a strong leadership team. A healthy church is open to the moving of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what God wants to do. It's unique in every church. But God will show us as we go. Do you believe that God can do miracles today still? I'm a, I'm a walk-in miracle, and so are you. God can do miracles, and we can't cap that. We don't know what he wants to do at this point. We have to trust him. And when he leads us, he will show us, and he'll reveal it to us. You're going to be placed in circumstances where you need the miraculous power of God in his spirit working in, in and through you. You're going to need that. If we're going to be healthy, we have to have an openness to the moving of the gifts of the spirit. We also have to be manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the evidence of the presence of God inside a believer. Lord, cleanse me. Take my heart. Do what you want with me. Help me to be obedient to you and to act the way that you act. May my heart be like yours, God. Cleanse my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. May I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Make me and mold me, this is what I pray. That's an old song we used to sing. I don't sing it too much anymore, but that's, that's what it's saying. So, 
A healthy church manifests the fruit of the Spirit. A healthy church regularly meets together both in large corporate settings and in homes. You see that in that scripture in Acts? That's why we're act, actually asking people to open their homes. Because discipleship can't happen merely on a Sunday morning. It has to happen when people interact with each other and live with each other and actually have relationships with one another. That's where discipleship really takes root and takes off because it gives us the opportunity to express the love of God in practical ways that we can't in a larger group setting if we just come here. If our church grows, man, if we, if we have to do something to expand our services or facilities, we can't lose that. We cannot lose that. It needs to grow. And I'm thankful for each of you that have, have opened your home because this is so important. And also, lastly but not leastly, a healthy church effectively evangelizes. Folks, I don't, I don't just want us as a pastor here. My prayer isn't that we just grow as disciples for the sake of growing as disciples. We don't grow fat and chubby so we can be self-sufficient and just feast on ourselves. We grow fat in the Lord so that we can be effective out there. And not That's a wrong... No. We don't grow fat in the Lord. We grow strong in the Lord. There we go. Yeah, muscle, spiritual muscle, not fat. Okay. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, <laughs> we grow strong in the Lord so that we can be effective for others out there. So we can take the gospel in power to a world that needs him. There's people around here. Maybe you're here today and you don't know the Lord. You need to come to him. Why? Because he loves you and he has this marvelous plan for your life starting here, resonating into eternity. And to be a child of God is the most glorious honor and privilege that there is in life. That's the most honoring, wonderful thing. If you don't have that, you're missing out. Okay, so if all those things are true, we have much to thank God for in 2023, but we have a lot of things that we really need to surrender to the Lord for 2024, right? Each of us here, when we analyze that. If you didn't need to grow spiritually, you'd be full of pride because <laughs> all of us need to grow spiritually. So let's ask the Lord to grow us. Philippians, Paul puts it this way. Not that I've already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's the bottom line. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have your words God, we want to be your people. We want to be honoring to you. When we start out in 2024, God, help us to keep perspective. Thank you for your patience with us, and thank you for your grace, and thank you for the beautiful things that you've done in and through us. Lord, we want to serve you more, and we want to grow in you. We want to mature in you. Father, as a church, we want to, we want to be here as a light for your glory. God, would you draw people closer to you this morning? And, and Lord, would you enable us to be the light that you've called us to be so that others outside of the walls of this church can hear the gospel clearly presented in both our word and our actions. In Jesus' name, amen.